welcome. Hi. Hi, I'm Tiara, chocolate sushi roll, and this is? This is Adam Beck. I'm from Hiroshima, Japan. Tiara, can you just tell everybody about you, because there might be some new people here today. Yes, okay. So I'm Tiara, and I started a YouTube channel called Chocolate Sushi Roll. So on this channel, I just really love empowering other mothers and parents to teach their child a second or even a third language by yourself and what you can do and kind of um, resources, empowerment, and play techniques. Myself, I'm a stay-at-home military um, family, stay-at-home mom. I have two kids. Jason, okay. my oldest, is five, and Olivia, my youngest, is three. And as a non-native, I'm teaching my children Japanese and Spanish. Yes. Great, great. Adam, can you tell us about your family? Well, sure. Um, my family, I, I've been in Hiroshima, Japan for quite a while. My wife is Japanese and we have two kids and my daughter is 16 and my son is 13. Actually, tomorrow is my daughter's birthday. So oh, she'll be 16 happy tomorrow. Right. And so, uh, well, I, I'm the founder of uh, Bilingual Monkeys, the blog mm -hmm. Bilingual Monkeys in the forum the bilingual zoo and the author of maximize your child's bilingual ability. And I want to be bilingual. That's another mm -hmm. one. So uh, oh, today we're going to talk about a very important topic. And today's topic is language exposure and language exposure is really the, the all important engine for generating success at a bilingual or multilingual aim. I mean, without language exposure, um, we really can't make much progress. So, um, you know, ultimately, I think the more uh, input that we can provide to our kids, the more progress they can make. So again, this topic is so important and there are a variety of ways to provide language exposure. And we're gonna talk about some of those today. Um, Tiara, how about you? Any general thoughts about language exposure? Uh, Tiara, I can't hear you right now. I lost you. <laughs> it's the okay, most, got you back. It's the most important part of this whole journey is language exposure. Um, I'm excited to get into it and talk about it, but basically, um, you have to show your children that you're, you're not the only crazy person in this world speaking this language, that it's a thing, other people are speaking it, they're having fun, and just the advantages that it gives them from knowing this. And, and uh, I know on the work side, but also just as a child, just the exploring side and meeting new people and getting to play and eat new foods and go new places just because you can speak another language and that's exciting for them yeah <laughs> yeah and i mean language exposure again it's so important i mean we can't overstate how important it is because without it we're not going to make progress right exactly and the interesting thing too is that you know there's so many different families in the world. We have so many different situations. We even have different goals, right? But, you know, if there's one universal thing, it's that every family needs language exposure because exactly. without it, you really won't get very far, right? Exactly. And the more you have of it, the farther you can go. Mm -hmm. So today, let's begin by talking about uh, the first important type of language exposure, and that is ample speech talking mm -hmm. as much as you can, uh, as much as possible from as early as possible to provide that oral input, right? That's right. And let me just say that, um, you know, when I'm talking about this subject, raising bilingual, multilingual kids, I might seem talkative, but I'm really in, in, in real life, I'm not necessarily that talkative, <laughs> but with, when, when I was teaching, uh, bilingual kids or my and working with my own kids, mm -hmm. I knew I was very mindful of the fact that I had to be very proactive about being talkative, right? Yes. So I have to remind so my husband all the time. Oh, go ahead. I'm like, you're their English exposure. Please talk. <laughs> you <Yes>. know? <laughs> 
Yes, exactly. And I mean, sometimes I understand, you know, like I said, for my own situation, I may not naturally be as talkative, but when you know how important exposure to the language, to the target language is, then you force yourself, you create yes. habits to enable yourself to be more talkative. And I just wanted to share two quick things about how to do that. And it's particularly difficult when you have a baby, when you have a small child that isn't really responding yet, right? Yes. So the communication is basically one way. You have to keep up a monologue, right? Yes. So what can you do? You can uh -huh. do two things. Number one, narrate your daily life. Mm -hmm. Give a play-by-play -play of what you're doing, what you're seeing, what you're thinking, what you're even remembering. You can bring back memories of your own childhood, um, you know, and talk about that. But this kind of narrating your life, what's happening uh, continuously, just talk about it. Just talk because it's the volume of input. Yes. So that's number one. And number two and is, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. And so I was going to say, even if you don't have kids, I know a few people on here, hey, Jacqueline, doesn't have, don't have kids yet, but that's a strong technique that you can use even without kids is narrating your day that builds your vocabulary. Um, and with your kids, even at any age, he said babies, but at any age, narrating is perfect. My kids are five. I have friends whose kids are 10. And you can say, hey, we're going to the bike. We're getting on the bike. We're going to ride to the store. When we get to the right. store, we're going to see oranges. And then we're going to pick out this. That's all narrating means. It doesn't mean it's just being mindful of talking about yeah. everything you're doing. Yes, exactly. And to help you do that, um, number two would be you can even post things around your house. You know, you can put pictures on the wall yes. and describe the pictures. You could even put a list of topics, you know, put a, topics like just single words that are, are enough. Dogs, cats, bicycles, you know, the zoo, whatever it is. And then just talk, just talk spontaneously about whatever comes to mind. It doesn't really matter. But what matters is the volume of speech, the volume of input. So the more that you can, you know, the more input, ultimately, eventually, the more output. Exactly. Right? Yeah, I know Adam talks about like a cup of water. If you keep pouring the water in the cup, what's going to happen? Eventually, it's going to overflow and the water is going to come out. So that's what we want. We want to just fill our children with the language and just fill it in until they just have no choice but to just let it burst out. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And there's even, I won't get too far into this, but there's mm -hmm. research behind this. And there was a study, I think it's 1995, that was done in the United States where mm -hmm. they uh, they took, I think it was 42 families. These were monolingual families, but the same principle applies to bilingual families as well. And what they did is in this whole process or this whole study took about six years, but they were recording what the parents were saying to the babies. Okay. Oh. So parents and babies, and they were recording what they were saying and how much they were saying. And ultimately I jotted this down, what they found, the researchers found a correlation between the volume of speech spoken by the parents to their children in the earliest years and the child's language ability and performance in school at a later age. And so run researcher said, of course, they were controlling for variables, but the important variable was how much talking the parents were doing. So again, mm -hmm. it's the volume of speech. You know, there's, there's research behind this. And the more speech you can provide to your children, whether that comes directly from you or from other speakers of the language, then the more progress that you and your children can potentially make. Ah, okay. Yeah. And that leads right into mine. Um, Great. Um, my, <laughs> my two are number one, play dates. Play okay. dates. Yes. Because you need to get them around natives. And I think that what you were saying about just, just filling them with the language as well as, as a non-native, he... Fortunately, has a Japanese wife, so they can get those, you know, nuances from his wife. But for me, I'm an American. I move like an American. I'm loud like an American. 
I'm a little bit rude, <laughs> like an American, okay? And I'm like the anti-Japanese, okay? So <laughs> I need to get them around Japanese people so they can get those nuances and just the way they move, the way they talk, um, the slang that they use. So you have that textbook language where in English you would say, I am going to the store. But if I was to say that to my child, I'd be like, oh, we going to the store. That sounded like two words, right? You heard, right. I'm going to in store. And you're like, what? So you have to, it's not really even slang. It's just the way we run um, slur words together. Sure. And that's hard to get from a textbook or these pre-recorded things they do because they're pre-recording it proper Japanese or proper Spanish, proper English. And so when you're around that native, and especially if you're around that native and her child, she's going to speak to her child the way she speaks to her child. She might change it up when she talked to you, but when she talked to her daughter, she's going to say <laughs> what she was going to say the way naturally. And that's what yeah. I want to hear. So I'm like, ooh, what she just said to her? You said you didn't say tie her. You didn't say tie your shoe. What did you say? You know, I'm I'm queuing in on all of that. She said something else. She said it a different way. So um, that's what I like to pick up. Now I'm gonna nice. add when you do a play date to make it the most you can. Try to have an activity. I'm all I'm a Pinterest mom. Have an activity ready with your theme of the week. So if this week you were learning animals in Spanish, then when they come to your house, you're going to have to have like, my favorite is I made a zoo. So I had like a milk the cow station. You can use a cereal box with um, <laughs> plastic, with a, the glove in the, cut the hole in the bottom, put nice. water or milk if you're not afraid of mess and put a little pin prick in the glove. Then they milk the cow. Then you take some cotton balls and print out a, sheep picture and then they can glue cotton balls to um the sheep or actually if you already have it glued on they can tear it off in the shear in the sheep you see what i'm doing here <laughs> yes I it's cute that. right and that. it didn't take me that, that much time i just printed out a cow picture printed out a sheep picture i already had cotton balls and they um take it off that shear in the sheep then you got to pin the tail on the pig and you create like this little form activity for them and that way the mom the four mom, she can lead this and help you lead it and say it in her um, native nuances and ways. Milk the cow. We're going to milk the cow. We're nice, going to shear the nice. sheep. And nice. that's what you and your kids have been learning all week. You've been reading books about farm animals. You've been watching YouTube videos about farm animals. And then you're going to conclude that week's lesson, so to say, with the play date of the mom and her daughter or her son coming over the family, the Spanish family, Japanese family, coming over to your house. And they do the little farm activities. Now, after that, let the kids be kids. They eat snacks and they run around and just let them play and be themselves. But just try to have that one thing that goes along with what you were learning that week. And yeah, that very nice. is what's right. going on. I, I think that's very, yeah, that's very <laughs> nice. The idea of, a, yeah. you know, a, taking a thematic approach to what you're doing and that you could do things related to that theme at home and try to bring that theme out into the world in some mm -hmm. way. So very nice. Yeah, very nice. Um, so my second, okay. <laughs> everybody gets two, is books. So as a yeah. non-native, he was talking about talk about your day and say this. And that sounds lovely and easy to do if you know what it is you're doing <laughs> in your second language. But I don't know how to say wash the dishes in Spanish or something like this. So how do we get these words? Yeah. Children's books. I have tons. So I talked about this a little bit last time about leaving books in the area of where they are. So I'll just say that briefly again. Um, if it's a bathroom book, a book about pooping, put that in the bathroom. If it's a book about playing with dolls, put that one next to it and leave them in these areas. So when you get over there, it's already there. and You don't have to think about right. it. You can go ahead and open it. If it's about brushing your teeth. Right. Which might mean right. go go get you some books about these different things, about different topics. Yeah, don't, don't put the book about the poop in the bed, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. got some stories. So how do we make this book come alive? Don't just read the book. I'm not just going to read this book. We're going to um, go beyond just reading a book, okay? So I picked a popular one. You guys know, brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? Mm -hmm. right they use the same phrase over and over again brown bear brown bear what do you see so later when you're in the car you say olivia olivia what do you see 
and look out the window. When you're in the grocery store, Olivia, Olivia, what do you see? Now, we might not know what we see, but we're going to say this phrase and we're going to see if we know something that we see. I might yeah, see sure. just brown. If you only know color so far in your language, then say, I see something brown. I right, see red. Right. I see. Right. And that's it. Leave it at that. And then once you learn, and this book is animals, then go to a zoo. Go to a little zoo and say, what do you see? I see a dog. I see a rabbit. I see a, and bring this alive and use it. And then when you go home at night, we going to read the book again. And it's going to hit a little differently this time because you spent all day kind of bringing this book to life that when you read it, they really do comprehend, okay. you know, Kumasan, Kumasan, nani miteru no? They understand that miteru no means what do I see? Oh, yes. <laughs> right. So. And I mean, you're, you're using books in a way that mm -hmm. actually takes you beyond the book into speech itself, right? Yes. So you're, you're bringing these two things together in an important and very productive way, I think. Yes. You know, for, for me throughout, you know, my kids are a bit older now, right? But, mm -hmm. um, even today, even if I don't see them as much as I used to when they were smaller, um, talking a lot and reading a lot, these mm -hmm. have been really the two main um, activities that mm -hmm. I've been, the two main efforts of my adventures with my own kids. And, you know, they really do work together well, as they Tiara do. was saying. And mm -hmm. so on a you know, there are various ways to provide language exposure. And I think we'll talk about a few more ways too. There's a range of ways, yes. but these two are so interactive and so productive, mm -hmm. right? And also I think the benefit of books too is that they can provide a richer form of language than, you know, daily conversation. Yes. So particularly conversation we may use with kids is not as rich or sophisticated as we might, you know, if we're speaking to adults, but even more so in terms of books that we can share with our kids, mm -hmm. there is a sophistication, a richness to the, mm -hmm. to the language that, that they won't get really for the most part in daily conversation. So yes. that's really important. And I, I think also for non-native speakers and Tiara, maybe you can, you know, talk about this from your perspective, but you know, what a non-native speaker maybe can do in terms of daily conversation, they can do more of if they have a book that offers, you know, richer language. So uh -huh. that's a really, really important resource, I think, for non-native parents yeah. who are also, you know, exactly. perhaps also learning the language too, and they can advance their ability and their children's ability at the same time by taking advantage of reading aloud day after day after day. Yeah, I'm all about sharing my resources with you guys. So if you are a Japanese learner, you can go to amazon.jp. As an English speaker, just change the language to English and you can still use Amazon JP. This um, company right here, they have books that are about third grade kanji level. It has furigana and they talk about everyday Japanese life like they have mm -hmm. how to cook rice, how to hold your chopsticks, how to use the bathroom, how to sweep. Those everyday things that he's saying narrate your life with. It's all right here in this book. Good. I don't right. know who the target audience was when they made this book. Because I feel like a native Japanese person would already know this. <laughs> and I feel like a, a, a Japanese learner would not know this book exists. But they had it in my library, y'all. And I'm so wow, glad I found great, it. So I already great. bought one of the the series, and I plan to like over time buy more. But you know, good. I ain't trying. We ain't trying to go broke, right? So this one I got from the library. So check out your library to see what they have. But if you can buy this, sure. I highly recommend. This one is the seasons, but they have like day to day life. They have just different um, categories. So and then you just again, like I said, you take those phrases when it's fall. I will use the fall page to talk about how the leaves are changing colors when we go outside. And then we'll go pick some mm -hmm. leaves. And y'all, I'm tired of crafting too. Bear with us. Do the craft, okay? <laughs> Look on Pinterest for something that's real simple. There's ones like the Skittles. 
when you line the plate with Skittles and then you pour some milk and then the, it makes a rainbow. That's simple. Then y'all can eat Skittles at the end as stuff you already have in your house. There's some really simple ones that you can look for. And I'll start sharing those on my Instagram more um, along with my play dates because I plan to do, starting once Corona free us up a little bit, I'm going to do a play date. Every week will be a different language. So we'll have an English kid over, then a Spanish kid, then a Japanese kid, then a week to rest my mind, and then do it again the next <laughs> month. <laughs> so I'll share what we're doing at each of those play dates so that you guys can see how I'm using the book of the week. Like this one's about space this week, this month. Okay. So we'll be doing an activity about space with a Japanese family to, to kind of Very drive cool. home Very these cool. planet names and things. Yeah. Yeah. And I I would emphasize, you know, what you're saying about bringing books into your home, whether that's from the library or if you're able to. And I do recommend for the target language, building a large home library. It's really yes. important, I think, to have books in your home. Yeah. And just one other kind of tip is, and I, I often mention this, particularly to families that maybe they have a less common language and it's harder to find books in their language, books that they like. But there is something called wordless picture books, and you may have run across these, but there are many, many of these mm -hmm. kinds of books. Mm -hmm. And wordless picture books, you know, like the name suggests, they have no words. Right. They have no language, language at all. Or language, however you read them. They mm -hmm. can be, you can tell the story in any language. You can tell it to, you know, to the degree of your own language level. So you can you know, use any sort of language to tell the story, even if it's only simple words or sentences. And you can also gear your telling uh, or talking about the book to your child's needs. So they're a really flexible and useful resource. You can Google them and find many, many wordless picture books. So we've talked about, what have we talked about? Talking a lot, reading a lot. Mm -hmm. And what other kinds of... Uh, well, language exposure are there? What what tingles, else can we do? See, she's been talking to us. Hey, um, she said a great one that I was going to mention: songs. Children love yes. music. If yes. you're dancing, if they're laughing, they're learning. We, uh, especially in our earlier days, my son don't want to dance with me no more. But <laughs> my daughter loves to dance, so we would put on Pink Fong, Baby Bus, um, Super Simple songs. I'm, these are all on YouTube in all the languages. They have Spanish, Japanese, Chinese, you name it. They got the same song in all the languages. So that means you can uh -huh. listen to it in English and later listen to it in, in uh, Japanese or Spanish. And the kids know the song because they knew it from English. You know, they got brushing teeth. Right. They got every day. They even got earthquake song. So you can learn so much from these as a parent and they all have captions at the bottom. So you can pause write that down and it's the same just like a book where we gonna use this later you know shake the little dollhouse like oh just she it's an earthquake girl you know right. just bring it to life and sing Absolutely. those songs i like right. to try to Singing. learn um a song every once every two weeks just learn uh -huh. one song and I, I don't put pressure on myself to actually like sit down and learn it but that just means like make sure we listen to it at least once every day and then eventually it's just uh -huh. like the radio if you listen to something every day eventually when the song comes on you're like mm, ba, mm, mm, ba, boom how do i know the words to that song yeah i remember that one right um then well, that yes. it's going to get yeah. into your brain so that's what we do make, make sure yeah, yeah that that's my experience with my kids i mean it's it's yes actively singing songs together that's part of it mm -hmm. but a big a big part of it can be just playing music of the target language in the background. If you're mm -hmm. persistent about that, I did that very mindfully, very proactively day after day after day. Mm -hmm. And what happens, just as Tiara is suggesting, that music really seeps in and, you know, the children even start to sing the song without, you know, having been taught the song. They just mm -hmm. hear the music and it really, you know, that sort of exposure can be uh, very valuable, I think. It's another mm -hmm. way to continue to add to the input that the kids are receiving, right? Yes. Day and I was um, okay. talking about themes. And I said our theme this month was space, outer space, and learning planets and kind of how why the moon looks the way it does. So on Pink Phone, they have an outer space song. They have a couple of them. So what we're going to do is 
we're going to listen to those songs this week. So try mm -hmm. to, if you can, keep within the theme for the music as well. So if it's, we were talking about farm animals earlier, we did our craft with our native play date over, we had some little farm cookies out and we played our game. Then we listened to on Pink Funk, Super Simple, Baby Bus, whatever your thing is, um, on YouTube. We listen to the song and we just play that while they're playing, having free time. It doesn't even have to be if you're in a no TV family. They don't have to look at the screen. You can um, just use your phone and, you know, turn it upside down and just listen to the words. And that's also okay. great, you know. Yeah. yeah, and we're talking about music. And I, I did want to mention this a couple of weeks ago. I wrote a review of this product. OK, it's not oh, my I product. It. I have no financial stake in this, but it's really a fantastic tool and i'm just going to show it to you it's called can you see it oh uh oh it's kind of breaking there we it go. up yes it's called chameleon reader okay there it is chameleon reader and why is it so fantastic and and i can't explain in a simple way how it does this uh, adam you know, i'm going go to show it review. on the screen okay mm -hmm. you can go to my review and you can you know read about it there or just go to the chameleon reader uh website and you can find more about it but what this can do, it's a tool, it's a kind of pen, but mm -hmm. you can add, it sounds amazing and it is, you can add audio to anything you want. And that means you can uh, turn all your books, any of your books into audio books in any voice you want, in any language you want. It's really mm -hmm. incredible, the, the flexibility and the, this, it's very effective for adding, for, for enriching your home with more exposure, again, exposure to the target language. So it's called Chameleon Reader. I highly recommend it. I only came across, well, it's a relatively new product, but I, I came across it only recently when they reached out to me and I was really, really impressed. And I, I wish I had actually had this tool when uh, my kids were younger and when I was, I was teaching bilingual, multilingual kids at school. Um, but I highly recommend it in terms of adding audio in very creative, very flexible ways, mm -hmm. any language you want. It's really an incredible product. Check it out. All right, that was great. Um, and I guess I'll do my not getting paid for promotion as well. <laughs> if you need those mama talk phrases because resources are important especially as a non-native speaker so i don't mind Absolutely. endorsing these products because they're doing a great job in helping us learn these languages so i use talkbox.mom and it's a uh, use spanish at home and this book even if you can't afford the subscription at the moment if you buy the book it's like um twenty dollars or so it has every phrase you see I've, I've marked my phrases of the week as um every phrase in here that you would say to your child like sit down wow. get off that slide go downstairs stop fighting with your brother don't touch the knives all those phrases that you're not going to find in the book um that you actually need right now with your toddlers yeah. running around you too loud sit down especially don't touch the knives right? don't touch the knives <laughs> i don't know why put down the they, knives they can't clean up but they can find the knife okay <laughs> you're you're glad it. you're done with that phase, right? <laughs> right. right. Um, well, that's great. That's great. Yeah, a book like not, that sounds. The first one very, I just opened, useful. Adam, was "Do not put okay. the battery in your mouth." <laughs> I literally, I just. I love that. It. I love okay. that. I definitely could have used a book like that. I'm telling you, when my kids are small, and they have Don't every language. Don't push the block into the VCR. We went through that. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know that was VCR days, though, right? But you oh. know, let, let me just let me just say resources. We talked about a couple of very specific resources, but you know, in general, when we talk about exposure, you can talk, 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 and that's very important, obviously. But beyond that, to do a range of other things, including reading aloud or playing music, you need resources, right? So this is uh, you, you need to make an ongoing commitment. Yeah. to finding suitable resources mm -hmm. in your target language or a wordless picture book, which could be used in any language or right. something and like- Right, and we might just do a live that's about expert. resources. But you need resources. Mm -hmm. And so really make that a priority, you know, throughout the childhood years. Right, exactly. All right, so Adam, if you're ready, 
we are right. wanting to hear from you all. Please, if you have sure. questions, um, now is the time. We're opening it up for comments and questions from you, the viewers. We ready? Um, Daniel, yes, I can say the book. Sorry, it was talkbox.mom. I'll type it here in the comment section. And that's the name of their website, even though it's for dads too. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, we we can say hi to some people. Can you see the chat as well, Adam? I can't see it. I'm sorry. Right. So if we somebody is watching and saying hello, I'm sorry, but I, I, I really can't see it. So Hi, girls. Sorry. She's learning English. Uh, of course, English. Spanish and Japanese. We have Ting from Australia. Oh, great. Hi. <laughs> hi, Ting. They're learning Cantonese. Oh, I love oh, it. Yes. So we in this kanji community together. Bill Fantastic. from Argentina speaking Spanish and English. Okay. Let's see. Oh, okay. He asked for the book name. Tiara, what was the name of the place who makes those books? Is it the Japanese books? Where are we? This one? I don't know the company. But if you put in the Zukan kanji or kisetsu no zukan it comes up really easily um i don't know where's the company name on here i'm not sure <laughs> i can't that's a see. massive book it must be a big company right yeah it's a really big book right it's this any like nec any so maybe oh any -O. it's any -O. -O. yeah i'm sure okay. you'll find it okay. i didn't have a i did not have a hard time finding it on um Amazon JP at all. Okay. Great, great. So if any anybody has questions any questions out there, anything at all? Yeah, so far not. All right, well, we could keep talking all day, y'all. <laughs> so endless amounts of exposure, I guess. There's so many different ways to do it. But you know, at the end of the day, it's really yes, about the, the volume. It's the volume of exposure, the volume of input you're able to provide your child on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And that exposure really needs to be as interactive as possible. It doesn't mean that, you know, more passive exposure like TV or videos, mm -hmm. that's all very useful too, but that really should be supplemental to the active, uh, interactive sorts of exposure like talking a lot, reading a lot, uh, listening to music, uh, singing songs together, um, playing games together, role playing together, for example. Exactly. You know, there are many, many types of activities that are more interactive, and then there are some that are more passive. And again, there's nothing wrong with that, but a child really won't become bilingual if you just plop them in front of a TV for, you know, 20 hours a week. That kind of exposure, I would say, you know, the majority of the exposure uh, needs to be interactive in some way, human yeah. to human. Okay, so we have tips for shy kids or kids with low confidence that are kind of afraid to speak. Yes. Okay. That's I very mean, good. Lead, yeah, lead with the child's interest. What do they really enjoy mm -hmm. doing, just naturally? And then how can you, you know, use your target language to engage them in that activity? What do they like doing? Follow the child's mm -hmm. lead. I, I think that's... I mean, that's how I've approached my own mm -hmm. parenting and as a teacher as well. But, you know, what can you do to, if your child is interested in dinosaurs, what can you do to engage them in dinosaurs, even in a small way, yeah. right? So, you know, take a day. It, it, and if you're not able to use uh, the target language throughout the day, it's perfectly fine to set aside 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever works for you to say that this is our language time. And mm -hmm. during this time, we're going to read books together. We're going to sing songs together, but we're going to provide, there's going to be exposure during that time. So you at least have that concentrated period of time day after day mm -hmm. where they're getting that input, right? That yeah. incredibly valuable input. Yes. Kiara, what do you think? I'm going to say um, when I've had a shy English kid, some of the things that I do, don't force them. And some people are like, they need to be speaking by now. It's been, you know, it's been a month. It's been two months or whatever. They need to be speaking it by now. And it's like, who, 
who said that? There's no time when they're supposed to be speaking it, so you don't want to force them. To make them comfortable. So, like I said, play dates are most important. So, see if you can find a family that's willing to come multiple times. So, we need to meet just very casually, no pressure, multiple times at first. And then once she's comfortable with that family being y'all's play date family and y'all meet every week and she realizes, okay, they're nice, we meet every week, then she'll start to open up in front of them. Um, so try to find someone that can commit to that level of um, language exchange with you. And there are families out there, so don't give up, that are, that are looking for you as well. Somebody that can meet with them regularly for that English. Okay. Right. And... What is it? Shy. Um, and I piggyback what Adam said. Find, follow the interest. And that's the most important thing. Um, we have a little girl that comes over here and she's so shy and she'll just hide behind her father. And I realized that she thinks Jason is hilarious. So once I found whatever it was that makes her giggle, then we're going we gonna to run on that. So then I'm yeah. like, Jason, Jason, come here. <laughs> Like, Jason, Absolutely. you need to do this for me so that she will get more engaged. And so he sometimes he's like, oh, man, you know, but it's like, come, come here. <laughs> so he'll do it for me. And it's like, just pop this balloon in front of her and then she'll get to giggling and that kind of loosens her up. So just find, just keep waiting yeah. and find that one thing that really just makes your little eyes glow. And once you found it, that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a playful Explored approach, it. isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, it's playfulness. I think we talked about this you know, in the last live chat, but, mm -hmm. you know, we have to be persistent, right? But we have to be playful at the same time. So it's playful persistence is what we need, I think. Right. All right we have Play. another question. And this okay. one his home for me. Okay. Ting says any suggestions on how to work through your child's resistance to language exposure? Like if you're playing music or TV and the target language and the child's like, I don't want to watch it. I don't want to see it are you know you're trying to talk to them and they don't want it they're not feeling it okay yeah. tr what do you think ah you're gonna let you me go it first hit, okay so right you. now <laughs> i have a very moody five-year-old <sighs> and I'm, we've just hit this landmark of moods like you know he decided i know what i want to watch on youtube i know what i want to be doing at this time and i think that's what it is um and so we're we're in this place of redefining our relationship because like when they were okay. three and four, you could just put it on and they're, you know, ah, my mama put on cartoons, but now he knows right. how to change it. He knows the remote. He knows what he wants to do. Um, so what do you do? How do you work through it? I think with me, number one routine. So if they know, like I was saying, I was doing Spanish an hour before bedtime. So if they know at 7 PM is Spanish time, regardless every night and you, it's hard for me too, but we need to stick with it and be consistent. And every day, set a timer on your watch, set a timer on your phone. At 7, when it goes off, boom. That means we're cutting everything off and this is what we're doing right now. We're having family time and we're doing the Spanish. We'll listen to it. And it might be something, you know, if you guys had a hard day, then just listen to it. If you guys are having a, um, a good day and you're feeling more energetic on that day, do more. Talk, sing, play a different game. But just fill out the child um, because if they're hungry... If their needs aren't met, they're hungry, cranky, um, hot, cold, any of these things, then they're not going to be receptive to anything. So make sure they're fed. Make sure they're kind of um, in a good mood before you're doing this because you don't want it to feel like a chore. You want it to be something fun. Kids like attention sure. from mommy. So maybe show them that they get this happy, fun, attentive mommy when you're doing language time. So don't you know, sit and you're, you're slouched on the couch. And you're like, all right, just put this language video on. Y'all y'all, come sit here and watch this. Like, I wouldn't want to do it either. So make sure that you're, take your happy pill, girl. <laughs> and just, <laughs> yo, guess what time it is? It's Spanish time, you know, yeah. and we're going to do it. And make sure you get up and you dance with them. Whatever you're expecting your child to do, are you doing it yourself? And that's kind of... Um, like, you, you're like, go read a book. Are you reading a book? You know, they're like, why aren't you memorized um, brush your teeth yet? Why don't you understand it? Do, did you memorize it yet? And it's kind of like if you kind of reflect that mirror back on yourself, you can see how high or low you're putting the expectations on the child. Yeah. That's yeah, my take. Yeah. I, I mean, 
I, I call it in my book, I call it the magical ingredient for motivation, something like that. But it is enthusiasm. And TR was just talking about that. I mean, the more enthusiastic we are about an activity, um, then the potential exists for the more enthusiastic our children will be. So we really need to approach it in that light. And at the same time, if we can make this an event, if we make it in a, you know, it's a special event and maybe it can include the whole family, even the, you know, the partner, the spouse that is not necessarily an active part of the bilingual journey. But if they can be a part of this too, that it can be a family event, like we're going to have a movie night on Saturday night, and we're going to all sit down together, and wow, we're going to have a great movie, and it can be a surprise, and we're going to have popcorn, and maybe even we'll have a lollipop, but we want to associate, mm -hmm. you know, positive feelings with this language, right? Yes. So the more we can do that, again, that comes through our own enthusiasm, but it can also come through you know, how we present uh, the resources or the activity that we, you know, we want our children to engage in, right? And, and so, you know, if you can enlist support from the whole family in some way, then the child that may be, ex you know, experiencing some resistance, that may help them overcome that resistance too, okay? What else? Anything else? No, we got, you know, great tips. These are great ideas. I'm taking note of everything. Um, okay, get them to make friends who only speak the target language. Olga, thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. When we have the Spanish play date, when we have the um, English play date and the Japanese play date, I do like, hey, when you enter my house, I know you speak English or you might understand, but I need you to cut all that. Okay, only speak Spanish, please. Only speak Japanese, only speak. Because if they find out they can speak the easier language, then they're going to take, it's it's only human nature. They're going to take the easy road out. And they're like, oh, right. she understands English. So I'm just going to still speak English, even though she's Spanish, you know. So right. don't let them, don't let them know. Right. <laughs> Keep it a secret. Yeah, children are pragmatic. I think it's important to remember that. It's a basic principle that children are pragmatic, they will take the easy way. So if there's a possibility to engage them, um, you know, so they feel comfortable and they feel like they can use the language, mm -hmm. even if you're coaching them or, or feeding them some of the language that they need, then I think they can make more of an effort, right? But right. again, that pragmatic side is something to consider. Yes. So we we're talking about my five-year-old <laughs> who is kind of cranky. So he loves Japanese. That's his number one favorite language. He says he doesn't want to go back to America because he loves Japan so much. Okay. He, he going back though. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So we have to do English lessons when he gets home because he goes to Japanese school. And a lot of people, let me say this, a lot of people think that because we live in Japan that we have like this advantage, you know, he goes to Japanese school. But either way, wherever you live, you have an advantage in one language, okay? So if he went to American school, he would still have an advantage in English. So I feel like we have an advantage in our one language, but I still have to fight him on the English now when we get home okay, we need to speak some English, we need to do English lessons. And so I do feel exactly what you're feeling about getting them to um, feel that resistance if they're like, no, I don't wanna do that today. I don't want to, uh, why do I have to do this? So I'm right here with you, yeah. Uh, Daniel says, how to cope with fear and not doing good to our children for trying to make them bilingual? How to cope with fear and not doing good for our children for trying to make them bilingual. Is it about the parents' feelings? Yeah, I think you know, this is like that, this is like mom guilt, as I call it. You know, no, I, what, I, what I really emphasize to parents is nobody's perfect. We're, none, mm. none of us are perfect at this. And it's a big process of trial and error. It's almost an endless process. I mean, it lasts throughout childhood if you don't, you know, give up. And the only way to fail really is to give up. As long as you keep going, your child will make progress. As yeah. long as you keep going and trying, 
right? So you, you can't, we don't, no one does this perfectly. We just have to keep going and doing the best we can. We try to learn, you know, from whatever doesn't work. How do we make this work better next time? Or maybe this just isn't going to work right now. So let's try something else. But yeah. I'll tell you that the, the parents, I've talked to many parents uh, who have shared this kind of idea, but that they feel kind of continually frustrated or they can feel that they're continually failing. But ultimately, and one parent summed it up so well, is that, you know, she keeps failing upward in a way. You know what I mean? All you <laughs> oh, have to I do feel that. is keep failing I felt that when you said that. You can, well, that's perfectly fine because you will, you know, the, you will generate progress over time as long as you keep going. So it doesn't really matter. You just have to keep going and doing the best you can to improve your own tactics. And that's why we talk about it. And, you know, you, you hear about other parents and what they've been doing and you read about it and you try things out and you know what I mean? So it, it comes yeah. from various ways, but finally it's about you and your kids and, you know, what you can do in terms of how to work with your kids because you know your kids better than any of us, right? Yes. But I would just, I would just really stress the idea that you don't have to be perfect at it. You just have to keep going. Mm -hmm. Just keep going. For no, I, I like that feeling upwards. I really did feel that because Daniel, you're not alone. I know I run these chats and I write and do the YouTube channel and share our progress, but I also feel the failure sometimes too. Like, um, for instance, my son, his English is not very clear right now. Um, he can pass any standard test. He's above, you know, reading level, all these kind of things in English but it doesn't come out super clear. Why? Because he prefers to speak Japanese 90% of the day. So again, he has that comprehension. If you ask him to write you an English sentence, he will write it. He understands everything you say. But when he goes to, um, like his, his common phrase right now is he says, I can't don't. I can't don't, mom. I'm like, what? I can't don't. What is that? You know? <laughs> so, and, and people are like, they assume that his English is perfect because he has American uh, parents. So I kind of feel like, in a way, am I failing him because if we had not introduced other languages, then maybe his English would be spot on. And, you know, you see, I've seen a three-year-old who speaks, like, clearer than me. You know, and I've seen four-year-olds, and you're looking at them, and you're like, oh, my goodness, our English is perfect. And then my baby with his I can't don't, you know, is over here. Um, so... I, I did feel that when you said failing upwards. It's like, I know we're doing a good thing and we're doing it, but in those moments, in those tiny moments, you do feel the mom guilt. And that's why right. I'm going to do a promo for Adam, y'all. But he made another <laughs> book with inspirational quotes in it. What's the name of the book? The, oh, is the, it the ebook? Yeah, the ebook. Yeah, it's called Instant Inspiration for Parents Raising Bilingual Kids, I believe. So it's a free ebook. It's you can find e it at my blog. Yes, I love it so much. I I got a notebook. This is just a little journal notebook. And I wrote down <laughs> my favorite quotes from it. And when I feel like I'm in a bad place, like I can pick one of these and like read it and know that, you know what, like he said just a few minutes ago, you are... You, the only way you can fail is if you quit. And you're only failing them if you stop now because you've already started yeah. something. It's like a snowball effect. It's already moving and it's bigger than you. So just keep it going. Right. And that ebook, again, right. you can download it for free. It's called Instant Inspiration. Just, mm. you know, search for instant. But it's it has over 600 quotes about various... Yeah, I'll put the picture up. Various aspects, I think, important aspects of the the psychological or emotional side to this to this experience because it can be i i think in a way i mean mm -hmm. the strategic side of it is important obviously but there's this also psychological or emotional side of it which can be very daunting sometimes and so what i did with this ebook is collect mm -hmm. quotes over 600 quotes that can be you know a shot of inspiration at a time of doubt or frustration so I hope it can be helpful to you. But again, yes. the main thing it is- It was helpful for me. I was trying to find the picture out, of you, it and I was gonna post yeah, it. Yeah, if you need definitely. support, reach out to someone. You can always come yes. to the forum, I'm the Bilingual Zoo for help. Yeah. All right, we have another question. Um, Ting says, question, when you have your play dates, do your kids ever ask you, the parent, to translate to your guests? 
since your kids know you are trilingual, has this happened before? How do you handle this? I, uh, does this go together? I think the fear comes from not understanding bilingual education well enough. Try to explain. Oh, you're helping out. Okay. So uh, about the play date question, do my kids ever ask me to translate for the guests? Um, no, no, my, my children haven't. But again, my children are just coming of age to be able to actually ask things like this. So, um, I think moving forward and our, after Corona, <laughs> when our play dates resume again, um, this may be something that comes up and I will love to address how I handle this with you, um, as it is, but my five-year-old is just starting to be able to ask things like, um, and, and realize that pronunciation is a, a word and a thing and because below five, they just got to take what they get. You know, they're playing ball with the kid and the kid's not speaking their language, but what I'm going to do about it? Because they don't have the words to say, mommy, what did you say yet? Kind of. Um, so no, I haven't. Have you, Adam, had to, your children actually translate for them? That really hasn't been an issue in our family. I mean, that comes up with many families, obviously. Uh, I think the main point would be that you continue being as consistent as you can about using the target language with your child, even if you do need to turn to someone else and use the majority language with someone else. But the more consistent you can be with your child about the target language, about using the target language, the more you can potentially, you know, condition them to use that language with you, right? And let me just, oh, TR, do you have something else? No, they're just saying, um, that's great. We as parents raising bilingual children need to stay motivated. And Daniel said, it's bigger than you. That's the scary part. He's glad he's not alone. So thank you. And yeah, um, absolutely. finding a You're community, joining these right. groups, joining these chats, joining um, like his Adam's forum, Facebook pages for bilingual parents, for non-native bilingual right. parents. That helps me because then you can see how other people are, um, I'm not going to say messed up, but how other people's journeys are going sure. and how, the, the, how they learn from their mistakes, how they did this. And they'll post about right. it and they say, you know, I realized I wasn't praising my child when they spoke in the second language. I only ever fussed at them in Spanish. And, and that's, oh, I realized I need to be happier. And you're like, do I do that? You know, so you get to, to see fuss in all the languages, y'all. <laughs> so so that they don't tend to to stray away from one because that's the trouble language but yeah we're in yeah. this together we're all having those doubts and we have those doubts about everything potty training my child potty trained late my pal potty trained early writing with a pencil so don't think it's just the bilingual thing they're gonna question you about everything she said her child was yeah. autism autistic and uh, people were saying she was doing not doing him good but that is just lack of understanding about how things work in our brain. And she said, uh, the fear comes from not understanding bilingual education well enough. Exactly. Okay. Thank you for sharing okay. that with us. Absolutely. And, you know, continue informing yourself the, the best you can, right? There's a lot of resources out there, a lot of online books, things like that. Yeah. Let me just sum up. We're probably mm -hmm. coming to the end now, but yeah. I just wanted to sum up uh, one you know, suggestion or a tip or even homework. Maybe I'll give you some homework. But I think it can be really useful from time to time to actually sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil and really think through what, what are the types of language exposure that my child is getting and how much are they getting of each kind of language exposure, right? So in terms of our conversation today about language exposure, if you actually do that and you kind of evaluate, you know, your child's current situation in terms of their language exposure they're receiving, the kinds of language exposure and the amounts, it can really be eye-opening in terms of, well, what is happening actually, you know, because it's very easy and, and difficult actually to go through day by day. And it's difficult to do that, to sit down, take, you know, quiet 30 minutes and really take a, a, a larger bird's eye view of what your situation is like. But it really can be revealing and empowering because then you can look and you see, oh, we're doing this and we're doing that, but I'm really not doing this as much as perhaps I could because hmm. I'm not really being consistent about, let's say, reading aloud every day, something like that. 
So when you do that and you assess your situation, you calculate the hours, and by the way, I would suggest, of course, as many hours a week of input as possible, the more the better, but you know, a good benchmark, a useful benchmark is something like 25 hours a week. Mm -hmm. If you're much less than that, it can be difficult if your aim is uh, strong and active language ability, okay? Yes. So there's no magic number. It, it really varies for every family because circumstances are different yes. and aims can be different, right? Mm -hmm. But anyway, it, it can be a really revealing um, opportunity to sit down and really think through what, what kind of exposure is my child getting right now? Yeah. And how much are they getting? Mm -hmm. And are there ways that we can shore up that exposure? Can we fortify it? Can we strengthen it? Can we increase it? What can we do, right? Yes. And then the more, again, the more you can do, the more progress you'll potentially make, okay? Yes. So anyway, that, that's the last thing I wanted to say. That's wonderful. But I encourage all of you to just keep going day by day. Again, the only way to fail ultimately is to stop, stop, plotting forward <laughs> day after day. Keep exactly. plotting, keep exactly. plotting, okay? Yes, that was perfect. Like, that was a perfect wrap up. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you okay. all for coming. We love you, Mwah. Make Thank sure you, you so like and subscribe. Yeah. Bilingual Monkeys, Chocolate Sushi Raw. Follow us That's on right. Instagram, YouTube, and we'll see you next month. Yeah, and this video will be uh, available at both channels. So, mm -hmm. you know, for any friends that couldn't make it tonight, then please share the link to the video. Yeah, share, share, Thank share. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay. Bye for now, everybody. Bye.